you say good morning to everybody. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. I'm Julius Irving. Haven't been in this building in a long time, but uh, it's kind of nice to be here. Not a, not a whole lot of room to make uh, three-point turns or U-turns in here, so drivers out there ready to back out just in case there's rejection this morning, as opposed to love. But uh, <laughs> have any questions? Favorite moments here? Yeah, they're, they're, I think they're probably too, too numerous to isolate anyone uh, and say that was the favorite moment. Um, there were some very touching moments here, needless to say, when I was first brought in to uh, become a 76er and I was no longer going to be a net. Um, I was welcomed with open arms. And uh, the first game coincidentally happened to be against an old ABA team. San Antonio Spurs, who, we had, who I had uh, great familiarity with, plus a couple of the former Nets players were playing for the Spurs, because Larry Keenan was there and, and uh, Billy Paltz. Uh, so I was totally a fish out of water. Uh, I knew more guys on the Spurs than I knew on the Sixers, because <laughs> I had just met the guys uh, the previous two days. And uh, of course, I knew George McGinnis. Uh, from the ABA experience, and uh, that, that was that was a pretty special night. I think I remember missing about six or eight free throws uh, that night, and that stood out because usually I was a decent free throw shooter. Maybe that was nervousness, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, it kicked off what was you know 11 straight years of uh, you know playing on winning teams, having winning records, always. Uh, going to the playoffs, uh, you know, seven or eight of those years, I think we were legitimate uh, contenders for the title. <laughs> and four years by being in the finals uh, it was very special for four times in, in seven years to go and, uh, to win in 83 against the dreaded Lakers. Uh, it's pretty special. So uh, there, were, there, were, there were many, many great moments. And I think as I spend you know, the next three hours in this building, uh, it's going to conjure up a lot of uh, things that I probably have forgotten about, but should serve very well uh, when I commence my uh, autobiography, which will be scheduled for 2009 to get started on. So, so this is really good. And so I appreciate the invitation on behalf of Mr. Snyder, 76ers organization, and Comcast. Flyers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, happy to spend a little bit of time here with you. What was the Spectrum crowd like? Well, uh, that was somewhat of a new experience for me coming from, uh, from the Nets and playing on Long Island. I think the fans were somewhat conservative compared to Philadelphia's fans. Uh, you know, Long Island, suburbs of New York. Um, Fans were very polite, courteous, very respectful, and Philly fans were just uh, nicknamed for fanatics because <laughs> uh, fans were really rabid here, uh, love the sports teams, and uh, love to see the team succeed. And anything less than your best on a given night was met with a round of boos and uh, probably some people waiting for you after the game just to, you know, just to put icing on the cake. Man, I don't know what you would think about today. Why this, why that? So uh, so there was a personal intimacy associated with playing in this building, but it also carried on outside of the building on many nights. Uh, and it was mostly directed at the opponents because I, I felt sorry for some of the teams that we had to play against, you know, especially if they beat us because uh, they didn't have an easy time, you know, leaving the parking lot. And, uh, they would they would come back and they would talk to us about it. Said, Man, y'all got some crazy fans. Guys tried to turn over our bus, and uh, you know that just helped for you know us to have a uh, more of an advantage when we played on home court, and that was pretty special. Well, did you say character quirks? 
Oh, 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 okay, okay. Well, yeah, just in terms of the setup, uh, you know, this setup, we were one of the better buildings in the league. Uh, I remember going to Chicago Stadium, and if you didn't put your shoes on the shelf, you know, they could be floating down towards the shower once everybody came in because uh, the water would overflow out of the showers and actually come into the locker room. Uh, there would be uh, creatures crawling around, uh, mice and rats. Uh, we didn't have that here. We probably have it here now. But, uh, and I, you know, next, next door you got fancy kiosks, you got restaurants, you got suites. Uh, when the traffic comes into the building, uh, you know, you don't feel a breeze on the court. I mean, here, uh, if you're on the court, when that door opens, you can feel it. <laughs> and uh, the, the arrival of the fans uh, when we sold out, uh, in large part, was to uh, generate some heat in the building and, uh, you know, make, make it a more comfortable uh, place to perform. Because uh, you were battling the, uh, the ice that's under the floor because of the hockey um, and uh, getting some heat in the building and then closing all the doors and getting people in their seats and generate some heat so, uh, so we could work up a sweat and, and do our thing. Um, I guess the greatest comparison or the easiest comparison would be, you know, you know we flew commercial and sometimes uh, commercial meant uh, flying on planes where, you know, there were like six first-class seats. So the veteran players uh, would get their first-class seats and the coaches and the non-veteran players, uh, pecking order-wise, would, would sit back and coach. Uh, no such thing today. Uh, you know, it's charter flights. You know, everybody's treated equally. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it's just uh, life above the rim, so to speak. So, so this building was, was definitely a coach a coach flight and a commercial flight versus uh, a charter flight next door. Yeah. I think I'm somewhat emotionally detached from most of the other situations. Uh, Boston Garden, the old Madison Square Garden, which I did play in as a, as a high school, uh, Chicago Stadium, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this one is, is the one that's meaningful to me uh, because I played here as a Sixer and uh, because this has been a you know, Philadelphia landmark uh, for many, many years. And, uh, and now there's a whole community of uh, arenas buildings here, if you will, uh, that you know, represent South Philadelphia and all of Philadelphia uh, to the world, uh, not just to the country, because the sport is global and all the sports are, are global and your communication is what it is. So, uh, so there will be a void when this building doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, I was, I used to kind of proudly uh, bring uh, family and, and friends uh, to Philadelphia and uh, find uh, a, a time to bring them down to, you know, view my statue out front or take them up to Ridge and see the mural, you know, that's, that's been preserved for a long time. So, you know, those days will be gone and uh, those opportunities will be gone. But, you know, they're gone for cause and for purpose and, uh, and hopefully, you know, whatever supplants uh, this building will, will be something special that some new memories can be created around. Well, we hoped it would be, even though it turned out sometimes that <laughs> it, it wasn't, because, uh, you know, that uh, great series against the Lakers when Magic Johnson had his coming out party. It was right here in this building, and uh, home court advantage didn't 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 hold up then. And we probably wasted a great uh, national anthem by Grover Washington Jr. because you know he would always uh, come for the big games and uh, acapella. You know, just played the national anthem. Uh, 
for us. And I think his record was in the 90 percentile, which was probably greater than ours. We were probably high 70s or low 80s. Um, but, uh, you know, it didn't always work. But uh, since we, you know, were a playoff team every year, and, and I, you know, in, in those years, we, we never had a losing record. Uh, I think the least amount of games we won might have been, you know, uh, you know 45 or 47. Uh, which you know, it's, it's kind of special. So we did have a home court advantage. Our, our home record was always better than our world record. And, you know, the building and the acceptance of, uh, you know, our, our locker room and, and uh, the ovations and the, the energy that was associated with the building and the dedication of our fans all played a significant role in terms of making us feel at home. And there's, there's a thing in, in basketball where um, it's, it's always acknowledged that uh, teams generally play better at home than they do on the road because uh, the coach tends to play more players and he gets more out of players, particularly the less experienced players, whereas on the road he's a little less apt to throw them in the game, not as, quite as confident in them. And, you know, when you have a few young players on your team, every time they go to a city, you know, they're, you know, they're kind of going to la-la land, away from the comforts of home, they, they want to explore, uh, don't have the same discipline that they have at home. So, you know, all kinds of reasons and rationale why teams might not, you know, play as well on the road as they do at home. 